ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's not my area of expertise. Let me put that up front. I mean, I've heard a number of sessions today. You are far more expert than I am in the area of education, training, and things like that. And you may say, well, get off the podium. You know, this is an <laughs> education and employers conference. But I represent possibly the only, at least, industrial employer here today. And I would like to commend you because nobody has told me today, what are you doing here? And you may laugh, but two years ago, I was at a giftedness conference in Salzburg where the organizers had asked me to come and talk because they know that Shell is quite uh, engaged in the importance of the talent pipeline, and I'll elaborate a bit more why there is this. And there were several people that came up, but what are you doing? Your industry, what are you doing on a giftedness conference? And I said to them, and these were like people in teaching, and said, oh, sorry, do you think this is l'art pour l'art, so this is art for art's sake, or do you do this because it has some utility for society, because we are your customers, the people that you train, we employ them and we, they work. I suppose I've got uh, one other piece of, of, of credential, perhaps, that many of you are teachers, and I have affinity uh, for teachers in two ways, that I am maybe not every day consciously, but uh, certainly every week conscious that where I stand is on the shoulders of all those that taught me. And that is, of course, to a large extent my teachers, and I could give, but I won't do that now, some very concrete examples where I've been able to do things as a result of what particular teachers did for me a long, long time ago. So teaching is an important profession. In a way, I'm also a little bit like you, a teacher myself. Although my classroom does not have 14, 16 year olds, my pupils are members of the European Parliament or people that work for the European Commission. Because what I do for a living in Shell is I actually educate people or I sell ideas or perspectives and try to see people, see things in a systemic way. So what I'll do in the sort of 25 minutes or so that I have, I will cover three things. First of all, I will give you an overall context, which is not educational, but an overall context, why what you are talking about today and what you are doing in your jobs is perhaps more important even than you think it is. Secondly, I will share with you a number of actions that the ERT, the European Roundtable of Industrialists, have decided to take to in a way help the initiative that you started today as well. And I will also share with you how the engagement of the European Roundtable of Industrialists has actually fled into the European 2020 strategy that was published in, um, in February this year. And I'll very briefly touch on the seven flagship projects that they have announced, of which three have to do with what we discussed today here. So uh, I'll stand here with two hats. So one hat is as the Sherpa, uh, as Nick said, uh, I'm the Sherpa for our CEO. He's a member of the ERT. The ERT is not like Business Europe. Business Europe is like the CBI, but at the European level. But that is actually an association of associations. This is a club of individuals. And the fact that you are a CEO of a big company does not automatically make you a member. I mean, you have to be kind of vetted for that, and then you're coming in. So this is basically a club of about 50 individuals who are the chief executive officers of the largest European industries. The uh, second hat with which I stand here is that I work for Shell already for more than 25 years, and I've said already in many countries in the world. I presume that being here in our home country, uh, you, most of you will have heard of Shell. Uh, we are a large energy company. We sit in exploration and production. We do all products and chemicals. That's probably where most of you know is if you drive a car. But what many people do not realize is that Shell actually is no longer an oil company. If you had to pick one source of energy, we are a gas company. We're doing 52% of our investments already go into gas rather than oil. And of course, we are also developing uh, primarily advanced biofuels, and already today, Shell is the largest marketer and trader of biofuels, not manufacturer. That will leave to the farmers, although we will make ventures into second generation biofuels, where, by the way, you need a lot of people with STEM qualities, particularly in the area of chemistry and physics. My work in Brussels has got to do, of course, with energy policy, resource policy, if you want to cast it broader, climate policy, and talent. And I might say, what's that combination? Because energy and climate is like two sides of the same medal. So you can see, yeah, that makes sense that you do both. Moreover, you work for Shell, so that's logical. Why talent? Talent 
for us is also a resource. You see here, resources, normally when I use this slide, I talk about resource, gas or oil or water or rare metals, etc., etc. but talent is also a resource. And you know, in order to secure a future and to develop the technology that we need and the human energy to go for a carbon-free future, talent is very important. In fact, talent is important for three reasons, and I'll elaborate that a bit more later on. The reason why, the second reason why Shell is interested in talent is perhaps this. The previous picture that I showed you showed you some pictures of massively big industrial uh, installations. In actual fact, the largest buildings in the world are not the skyscrapers in Abu Dhabi. They are the buildings that we built, only most of it is standing underwater. And they're also the costliest project that the industry produces. The single biggest industrial project going on at this moment in the world is the Kashagan project, in which many, many companies are involved because no single company, not even the side of Shell, could carry that. It's a $130 billion project. Now, if you do a project like that, you do appreciate that we don't build those for a long weekend. They actually stand for 30 to 40 years. Now, if you do projects of this magnitude and of that duration, then you have to develop a way to make sense of the future, at least the future of the next decades. Now, we cannot forecast the future any better than anybody else. But what we did do a number of years ago, about 45 years ago, we developed the scenario thinking. Scenarios are not forecasts, but they are very well considered, internally consistent, possible futures. Now, this is not a scenario presentation, so I won't elaborate on that. But as a result of that, we are inherently embedded into systemic thinking. And systemic thinking means understanding causal relationships. It also means understanding lead times and lag times. And therefore, what are important priorities and which things need bottlenecking first. And ladies and gentlemen, talent, and somebody said it already today, you should look at as a pipeline because the pipeline is not measured in miles, but in years, and it goes from a four, five, six-year-old boy or girl to a 22 or 23-year-old graduate coming out of Warwick, Cambridge, or where have you. So these are rather long pipelines. And what I'll be telling you is that actually Europe's STEM talent pipeline is in trouble. <coughs> now, just like with any pipeline, if I stop sticking things in the pipeline, the people at the other end for quite a while don't notice it because they keep living on what was put in in previous years. If we let it go unmonitored and unmitigated, by the time they find out at the other end of the pipeline that there isn't anything coming out and they say, hey, alarm, put in more, it will take 20 years before they have more. So a good manager, and a manager to me is a prime minister as well as a minister, as well as a CEO, does not let it get that far. You manage it when you monitor that the flow is no longer going at the rate it goes, because you cannot go to Tesco's and say, can I please have an engineer, pa oh, a family pack of engineers, please. You know very well they don't grow on trees. So what is this broader context why what you do is so incredibly important? You can see from my gray hair that I've been walking around on this planet uh, for quite some years. And I was born some 50 years ago. There are th three and a half billion people on this planet. Today, they're about six and a half, and I'm only 50. If I will make it to the average life expectancy of a white male living in Northwest Europe, I will get 82 or something like that. By the time I die, there may well be eight to nine billion people on this planet. That means that just in my lifetime, just in my lifetime, the global population will have traveled. The global population will have traveled in the lifetime of a single person. And where they live, you can see on this map, of course, having traveled as much as I do, I like maps. Now, this is a quite unique map. You may have figured out already, have I had too much alcohol for lunch? Well, it's not possible because it wasn't served, and just as well. <laughs> but what you see here is actually a map of the world whereby they try to remain faithful with the shape of the country, but whereby the size reflects the population. So yes, aha, where is Australia? Oh, that's this little thing down there. Any Canadians here? Also in for a bit of inferiority complex? <laughs> as far as population is concerned, of course, both Australia and Canada have huge resources, but as far as people are concerned, they're quite small. 
And note that the big countries in the world are countries like Mexico, Brazil, Nigeria, and particularly, of course, India and China.